Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your phones off. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor Jin Huan Kim. Professor Kim is assistant professor of accounting in Stanford University. Professor Kim's research focused on the economic consequences of corporate disclosure. His research investigated uh, how traditional and non-traditional forms of corporate uh, disclosure affect the capital market and real uh, outcomes. He holds a bachelor degree and master degree from the Columbia University and a PhD from MIT University. Now we will start our seminar with dear Professor Kim. I, uh, thanks, Muhammad, for the kind introduction. Um, very uh, great honor to be here. Um, I'd like to present my uh, early work. I'm Jin Wan Kim from Stanford, by the way, and this early work called uh, Innovation Consequences of Judicial Efficiency. Um, joint work with uh, Taryn Chi, who's a P PhD student at Harvard and co-author uh, Rodrigo Verdi at MIT. So um, at a very high level, uh, the basic idea of this project is to investigate sort of the relationship or impact of what we call judicial efficiency, uh, broadly defined as what we would consider a better match between a judge's expertise in a certain patent, you know, certain patent cases uh, to the judge and how that better match, or again, what we define as judici judicial efficiency affects uh, firms' uh, incentive to innovate. The sort of key force here is that when there's more and higher judicial efficiency, it reduces sort of the uncertainty of the litigation outcome of patents, which in turn incentivizes firms to innovate more. So we'll sort of delve into this idea a bit more, but that's the high level idea. Um, to motivate that question, I think it'd be helpful to sort of provide some background uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And by the way, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point in time. Uh, the idea here is that uh, to begin with a patent system, uh, sort of at least in the United States, where the idea is that an inventor who produces innovations and inventions spend resources, time, and money to produce valuable patentable innovation. And the reason why these inventors sort of do that, or at least one of the reasons, is this guarantee of uh, being able to extract monopoly rights and rents uh, if, if uh, once these uh, innovations are patented, so that the patent system is able, or the patent monopoly rights and rents, is able to recoup some of the costs that these inventors have incurred. Uh, a key and important friction uh, that sort of prevents uh, this ideal world from happening is that in reality, the boundaries of these patents are unclear. Unlike say real estate or you know, factories you might buy, the boundaries that cover your innovation, if you say develop a touchpad screen on cell phones, how much of uh, you, know, you can claim for that sort of invention is unclear. And I'll show you some sort of discuss some examples of that. So, you know, diagrammatically, the idea is that you have some expected scope of patent, but in reality, it's, it's fuzzy. And again, as I kind of alluded to it earlier, the key sort of friction here is that this um, can cause frequent patent disputes in sort of disagreement on where the patent scope or boundaries lie and can in turn have a negative impact in expectation for patenting their certain innovation. So, in sort of a, I think a sort of example, a great example that illustrates this point is that in theory, scientific principles are not supposed to be patented. So, you know, the Pythagoras theorem of uh, triangles or some, you know, equation on laws of nature, you know, F equals MA by, by Newton, those things are not supposed to be patented or patentable. But, um, Unlike those edge or, or corner cases, in reality, we encounter a lot of situations where it's kind of unclear. You know, for example, uh, there was a dispute between LabCorp of America and Metabolite, where I forget which what, which company uh, made the development, but one of the companies basically developed a method of detecting some kind of correlation between two chemicals. Um, homocysteine, which I don't know how to pronounce exactly, and, and, and vitamin B. 
And the debate here was whether this was a scientific principle or a novel invention that can be patented. And in 2006, the court ruled that it is patentable, that it is not sort of a you know, mathematical equation per se, but, a, but an invention. But what's interesting is that six years later, in 2012, in a very sort of similar you know, scientific situation and debate, uh, another company developed yet another type of correlation, correlation detection. Uh, but in this case, the, the court ruled that it's not patentable because this actually is indeed a scientific principle. So this example kind of illustrates the unclear boundaries and, and more importantly in our context, that courts themselves can contradict each other. There's un unclarity and consistency. So I think this quote uh, kind of illustrates that point very well by Lauren Sung, who's a senior attorney and, and a partner at, at this uh, law firm, basically says, if I can read this out, uh, patent litigation stands among the most complex with disputes about cutting edge technology muddied with esoteric and arcane language laws and customs. When compared to other adversarial actions, patent cases can uh, benefit significantly from having a judge hear the case who is familiar with the technical issues. So that's, again, our concept of greater judicial efficiency. So going back to this chart, uh, our paper is essentially this, where given this friction, if we introduce a more efficient judicial system, can it perhaps have a positive impact on, on reducing this friction of, of unclear boundaries that again reduce the potential expected monopoly rents of innovating because conditional on your patent perhaps getting sued at some point in its life, uh, you don't wanna face this sort of uncertainty. As I'll discuss in a few slides, uh, there are other potential forces why, uh, where efficient judicial system that might actually exacerbate this negative impact. So it's not a one-sided prediction, but we want to, in general, more uh, sort of investigate how this efficient system of judicial, uh, of the judicial system can affect uh, corporate innovation. All right. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I have, a, yeah, sure. yeah. Do you want, uh, you have, I have a question. So, uh, so in the earlier example, the case court that you mentioned that uh, if, uh, if the later case uh, that was considered as a non-patentable, uh, then the plaintiffs, so they can actually file a dispute, right? Is it? That's correct. And uh, that's a very good question. And, and companies may file disputes. And in fact, um, the frequency of how much uh, sort of appeals, I, I guess is the word we're looking for, where they can sort of appeal the, the outcome of, of these cases and court go to the, the higher level appeal court. And in fact, uh, that that measure itself, that frequency itself, is sort of a nice measure of how efficient a court system was to begin with. If, if there's less sort of appeal, perhaps they've uh, arrived at, at this level of what's called a district court level, uh, where, where the both parties were could agree on, on sort of the outcome. So you're right, they can appeal. And we'll actually exploit that measure. Court efficiency, that's, uh, so you define it as, a, as so there's a more agreeable between the two parties? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So right now, the sort of the idea that we have in terms of efficiency is how much both parties can agree. And also, one other important dimension is how quickly they can, conditional on all other things being equal, how quickly they can arrive at the conclusion as well. So those two are sort of the idea that we have in mind, how, how agreeable they can be and, I, and also perhaps more consistent they can be, as well as how more, how, how, uh, how quickly they can arrive at that quote unquote agreeable solution or outcome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the, the question. Um, yeah. And please, everybody, uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. So we want to introduce this efficient system. Uh, and just to, before I jump into some of the motivation of the, of the theory and, and sort of the story, three things we believe is important of this study. First, it's a very economically important uh, sort of setting. Uh, survey evidence, for example, says close to 50% of, of firms uh, view patent litigation as a serious uh, sort of consequence to uh, whether they would innovate or not or patent their, their projects. Uh, and in terms of academic research, our, our study folk, uh, sort of fits into two broad literatures in our view. One is the, uh, this literature on institution and innovation that talks about 
um, how certain institutions like government, financial markets, and our, in our case, legal systems sa shape innovation practices. And also more specifically to this uh, literature on, that tries to understand how the enforcement of patent law affects innovation. Uh, one of the key findings of this area is, or, or sort of, you know, uh, findings is how levels of enforcement affect innovation. Uh, our paper, in our view, uh, complements this area by sort of explicitly considering this unclear boundary notion. It, uh, at least in empirical research, it seems like this idea has not been as, uh, uh, you know, is, is relatively underexplored. And by incorporating that, we can sort of understand how the efficiency in enforcing these uh, patent laws through the judicial system can affect uh, incentives to innovate. And as we'll talk a little bit more, we're going to exploit a very specific policy called the patent pilot program, which also has uh, policy implications that I'll discuss in a bit. So um, before I sort of motivate the prediction, I think you'll be nice to have some background on how this court system works. And I think it's kind of related to my discussion with Xu Qing just uh, a while uh, uh, that we had uh, uh, just before. So first of all, there's in the US, there's 94 what's called district courts and all patent cases are filed at this level. It's the lowest level of court that's sort of spread out geographically across the United States. And what typically happens in this case is that patent litigation or cases are assigned to what's called generalist judges. So these judges uh, have to deal not only on intellectual property litigation or patent litigation, uh, but also criminal trials as well as tort liabilities. So um, this random assignment, while many would consider to be the most fair way to deal with patent litig or excuse me litigation in general, it is all, it's always been sort of argued to have caused potential inefficiencies because of the fact that, uh, especially in, in IP or intellectual property type litigation, where a lot of complexity and nuances and expertise are required. So to counter this mismatch between judges, uh, we will explore a setting that, that, that helped uh, bring some variation in terms of this expertise match. So with this discussion, on the one hand, we might expect with our discussion so far, perhaps an efficient judicial system. We're defined by a quote unquote general idea of better match between judges and patents. That again would lead to uh, quicker uh, outcomes as well as more agreeable outcomes of, of litigation can perhaps reduce the uncertainty and these legal costs for seeking patents and, and in turn expect or confer higher expected benefits and incentivize firms to patent their innovation and, and uh, invest in innovation. But what's also important is that uh, it might also have a negative effect. And, and this is precisely the harshest, uh, sort of the critiques that's been given to this non-random assignment is that it can promote individual biases because now in this better match system that will assign explicitly in a non-random way, uh, certain expert judges to certain cases, it might uh, sort of promote or exacerbate certain biases that judges have. For example, certain judges might have very favorable uh, views on uh, how large corporations uh, can patent their innovations, which might discourage and crowd out smaller inventors to, to innovate. So it, it might promote biases. And if, if we swing on the wrong side of their biases, perhaps it could discourage innovation uh, of certain, at least firms. Uh, it also, in a related point, there's all, it's been argument that I can create monopoly rights. One of the key nice things about random assignment is that it, it taps into a broad base of judges and it can sort of do a checks and balances among themselves. But if it's confined to a smaller number of judges, it can promote overconfidence and uh, actually reduce the quality of, of the judges they make. So it's, we view this as an ultimately an empirical question. So, um, sorry, if I'm going too fast, again, please uh, feel free to uh, interrupt. So uh, how are we going to, sorry, did I hear a voice? No? Okay. So how are we going to measure judicial efficiency? So we, there's at least two sort of challenges. One is, you know, regardless of how we empirically measure it, we can maybe think about time series variation. Over time, perhaps certain courts become more, you know, have judges with more expertise. 
but this is going to be challenging to exploit at its on its face value because, for example, in the U.S., uh, the court rulings are based on a long history of precedent, so it takes a long time for judges to accumulate, you know, expertise. Uh, and because of this nature, uh, from an identification standpoint, separating its effect from other social events and technological changes might be challenging. Then we might say, hey, can we exploit cross-sectional variation uh, you know, across, say, different courts, uh, geographically, let's say. Um, can we exploit that? You know, certain courts might have judges with more expertise, more experience relative to other courts. Uh, this, again, might, will probably suffer from uh, various endogeneity issues. Uh, for example, counties or courts that have greater economic growth or shocks uh, perhaps are more conducive to fostering an environment of in innovation as well as an efficient court. So these are key challenges uh, to, to keep in mind as we go. Uh, but to circumvent some of this, uh, we'd like to exploit this setting. The, it's called the Patent Pilot Program. I'll refer to as the PPP from now on, which was enacted in 2011 and essentially assigned uh, 13 out of the 94 judicial districts across uh, the United States to adopt a non-random, uh, a, a promote a better matching between judge expertise uh, and specifically patent litigation, uh, not for all cases, but just for patent litigation. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea, a, a chart, this is what happens uh, after 2011 in these 13 districts. And this ran up to 2021. This has concluded very recently. It was a 10-year pilot program. So this is what happens. So there's still an initial random assignment in these 13 judicial districts where they assign it to what's called an expert judge. And how we define this expert judge in these districts is that it's, a, it's, a, it's at, at heart a sort of a revealed preference kind of thing where judges who are you know, uh, committed and interested and have the right criteria can sign up to be and you know, self sort of proclaim essentially as an expert judge in these patent cases. And if it's assigned to them, then you know, it, it, it is assigned to one of the experts. They review it as that way. Uh, on the other hand, there are a number of judges in these 13 districts who are non-designated. They might get the assignment and one of two things can happen they can either accept it, even though they're not you know, experts uh, per se, or at least they didn't identify themselves as patent experts, they can um, choose uh, sort of to carry the case or reject it, in which case it will be assigned to one of the other PPP judges in that same district. So unlike the other 81 districts, 94 minus 13, who will continue to do a complete random assignment, these 13 courts will now have a higher mechanical probability of getting it assigned to some expert. In addition to this sort of revealed preference of expertise, there are two other aspects that I think, or we think, that increases expertise among these judges. One is an explicit training program, as well as extra funding. But excuse me, before I keep going, I saw a hand up by, yep, Emin. Yeah, no, thanks, a fascinating topic. I just think this area is uh, uh, rife with uh, expert witnesses on both sides. And the recent trend that I see in other cases, I don't know of IP, but in my area of taxation, uh, so I'm, I'm from Canada and we have tax court of Canada before it, where the, the judge is a tax lawyer, and then it goes to other things, but there are expert witnesses on both sides and the judge even insists that those two experts agree on where they disagree. So they have to lay out, this is my position, that's the opponent's position, and we both agree that this is where we disagree. So sometimes that takes away or reduces the need for judicial expertise because the expert witness do a fair bit of heavy lifting. Just a thought to share with you, thanks. Oh, that's a great point. Um, I don't think that, uh... So you're saying to the extent that there, I think what, what can matter in our sort of in our setting is that uh, to the extent that there's these high quality expert witnesses out there, it might sort of reduce the need for, for an explicit efficient judicial system. That's very interesting. One thing that uh, I think kind of is related to that as I was about to say this is that 
not only is there better matching again, but there's a, a, an explicit program that trains the judges to become more acquainted with the certain patent laws who, again, assign, signed up to be this patent specific judge, but also this extra funding piece, I believe, uh, includes things like their ability to sort of assign the right expert uh, witnesses and, and these patent, patent clerks to support the judge's case and facilitate the entire process. So uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, point. I, we, we don't know if we can kind of in explicitly include that, but it seems like a, a, perhaps even a substitute perhaps to this, to this whole uh, judicial process. So thanks for the, the comment and, and we'll think more about it. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, again, please interrupt anytime. Uh, and consistent with you know, the cases being now, in, in, at least in these 13 districts to the expert judges, uh, just as an example, the Southern District of California, which is one of the 13, uh, there's 20 judges that are always sort of on standby, the, all, all judges, five uh, sort of were identified as these experts, and they actually heard, uh, were, handled 75% of all patent cases, again, speaking to this, you know, uh, assignment, non-random assignment to these five experts, and just as an example, we, you know, we don't have systematic data for this. This was sort of us digging through some anecdotes to validate the shock. Uh, Judge Kathy, uh, for, for example, it was an attorney who specialized in IP litigation for more than 20 years before she uh, became a judge in this district, which is consistent with her sort of expertise. Uh, just visually, and, and to give you a little bit more of a sense of how these 13 districts were um, selected. Sorry, I saw heard some noise. Is that somebody trying to ask questions? No? Okay, um, just to give you some context on how these 13 sort of districts were selected, um, there was a central office called the Administrative Office of the US in Washington, DC, where they initially selected actually 14 district courts. And uh, while 13 out of the 14 complied with this uh, sort of uh, mandate, one opted out. It was there. They had the option to uh, say we don't want in on this, and one of one district was southern, the southern district of California. Uh, there was one required criteria that the Congress imposed uh, on this office was they wanted diversity, uh, so that it's not concentrated in one to particular region. So they wanted at least five district courts out of 94. Well, we it ends up being we had 13 and across three regional circuits, which is a higher level concept. There's technically 13, but in our case, 12, and we'll skip that detail. But anyways, uh, they wanted geographic diversity. Uh, another criteria, which, you know, admittedly, uh, in our view, from uh, sort of speaks to some non-randomness in this selection, which is, is not uh, ideal, perhaps, but still, to, just to be uh, fully full disclosure, there was an optional criteria that they, was unclear, a little bit of a black box, how much they sort of um, stuck to this, but they wanted uh, to have the, the 15 high courts with the highest number of patent lawsuits uh, in 2010 to be part of this program. In the end, they only selected seven out of the 15 and, and, and kept eight as the control group. Again, it would have been nice if the regulators randomly just uh, you know uh, chose these districts. Clearly there were some uh, you know, characteristics that they, they relied on to select these, but uh, our hope is that they've selected in a way uh, where the control group and the, the treatment group, the, the, the 13 treatment districts, are reasonably comparable enough, for example, seven versus the eight in this case, uh, so that we can run reliable tests. And we'll have additional tests to sort of speak to this non-random choice in, in a few slides as we discuss the results, but just wanted to give you that context in a visual representation. So um, just to give you a high level idea of our research design, we'll talk about the details a little bit as well later, but it's basically a difference in differences design where we wanna compare since 2011 when it was enacted, before and after across these treatment ports. So more specifically, we're going to investigate firms that are headquartered in these 13 uh, uh, PPP courts against all the other firms that are headquartered in the other 81 control districts and do a difference in difference analysis. Uh, we're going to start the post period to be from 2012 to 2014. We start from 2012 because our interest, variable of interest is innovation. 
And we want to give firms enough time to respond to at least a year in our case and have a symmetric pre-window from 2008 to 2010 and leave out 2011 uh, when, when, when it was first proposed as sort of a benchmark. All right, so just to summarize our findings before we jump into the details, uh, we first begin by validating the setting. So we wanna show and find whether the PPP indeed improved judicial efficiency in, in these pilot courts. And uh, consistent with my earlier discussion, uh, we're going to look at whether it reduced uh, the duration as well as uh, whether it reduced uh, the likelihood of appeal. And that's what we find consistent with the PPP improving efficiency as these two observables were available to us. And consistent with a positive effect story where the efficiency perhaps reduces uncertainty on these litigation outcomes, firms that are headquartered in these treated counties are about 6% more likely to innovate or produce patented innovation relative to firms headquartered in all other counties. And uh, we also look at research inputs because patents uh, sort of combine both a firm's decision to innovate as well as their decision to patent. We wanna look at whether firms are actually investing in innovation. And one input, we, important input that we look at is uh, a labor market effect. And we find, again, firms that are treated in these districts are more likely to both retain and hire uh, patenting engineers, as we'll sh I'll show you in a bit. And we have three mechanism tests uh, sort of uh, that speak to the narrative of our story or paper. Uh, one, uh, we find that uh, our positive effect is more pronounced among innovations that are considered more fuzzy, where the boundaries are more fuzzy. Uh, Mechanism two, we want to show that it's concentrated among firms that have greater litigation risk, because again, that's sort of what we believe is, is at play, where the, the PPP is reducing uh, litigation uncertainty and risk. And three, uh, we find that the positive effect is more pronounced among firms that are resource constrained. Uh, again, this is consistent with uh, firms that are resource constrained are more likely to suffer uh, conditional on there being a litigation and the PPP helped resolve some of that burden for these uh, resource constraints slash smaller firms as I'll sort of show you. So the, uh, yeah, uh, Josh, oh, sorry. So I think Josh had his hand up first and I'll go to the next one. Yeah, just going back to that main finding summary, is there a sense that this was gonna be, um, that this pilot program wasn't gonna go away? It seems like if I'm gonna start to invest in efficiency, I have to, expect that this new appeal system, this new court restructuring will be persistent and not just disappear. Yeah, that's a great point. Revert, to, uh, revert to the norm. Yeah, no, that's totally reasonable. We haven't explicitly explained that crossed our mind as well. Our, our current, well, first of all, I, the companies knew that it was gonna go away, but it was gonna go away after 10 years. And there was some expectation that it might be permanent, but the initial launch was that it's going to be for 10 years. Our current post period is, is sort of the, the first three years. So perhaps 10 years was permanent enough that they would sort of change these uh, strategies. But uh, in, in later years, it might revert back to the, the pre-shop norm. We haven't investigated that yet. But consistent with your intuition, if, if in later years they sort of know that it's going to revert back and it's not going to continue, um, they, they might definitely revert back. We, don't, we, we didn't test that yet. <clears throat> and um, we honestly, at this point, don't know how much of, of uh, sort of a, a clear expectation that the Congress gave in terms of whether they're going to ex extend it or not. So we'll, it's a great point. We'll, we'll sort of investigate that. Yeah, it seems like you might estimate an effect each year and just see kind of plot what this diff and diff is each year and see yeah. how it decays or becomes more even stronger, more persistent, but kind of exploring that time series of we're getting close to the end of this pilot program, what's gonna happen? That's that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's just to understand your point, I think it will re revert back. So after the three years, we see a consistent pattern, but perhaps if we could extend that window further out, it might, might sort of decay as we go closer to the end of the program, right? And they have a clear expectation of, of whether it's gonna continue or not. Yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, so I have a question about the 
uh, the following the can the can the uh, pattern of firms or the or the inventor uh, decide where which court they can file the case? Yeah. So can so if I understand your question correctly, it's a institutional question of whether firms can file in other courts. Is that yes? Yeah, so how is it decided? Yeah. So that's a great point. And and. Uh, it, they can in, in, in principle. So it's called forum shopping, where, where firms can uh, not necessarily stick to the, the, the court that they're headquartered into, but can strategically choose other courts. Um, now, it, it turns out empirically, so we verified this, it's not in the, the sort of the slides today yet, but very recently, we, we found that about 70% of either the plaintiff or defendant ends up being having the uh, case in one of their headquarters. And this is consistent with some of the legal guidelines on where they should sue, which is roughly speaking where the economic activity of the patent happened, which is uh, likely to be the, the headquarter in which they're, they're in. Um, however, sometimes again, there's fuzzy boundary on that as well. So they can choose certain courts that they're uh, likely, you know, more favorable uh, and, and strategically choose other courts that will threaten this uh, sort of assumption we're making where a firm is treated at their headquarter. So yeah, that, that's okay. a threat. Um, upon thinking about a little bit more and feel free to push back, we're thinking about this issue ourselves as well. Uh, it, 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 if anything, it, to the extent that firms would forum shop to the headquarters that are treated to enjoy this efficiency benefit, we felt that our estimates would therefore be a little bit more conservative because to the extent that there's crowding in of firms into these efficient courts, it will crowd these treatment courts and perhaps reduce their efficiency. Um, however, again, empirically, uh, I'm not sure if I included that chart, we don't find sort of strong evidence of forum shopping. Uh, it seems like the number of cases across all these courts are very consistent over time but it is a poss legal possibility. So what's the, I mean, just wondering, you know, since, since you said that it's a, if it's a crowd out, then the, uh, you know, what's the magnitude of the cases for each uh, judges uh, that, that you're talking about? Okay, sorry. Can how you many remember? cases, how many cases the court judges are actually handling? Uh, oh, I see. I, uh, so I, I don't actually have that exact number on my head right now. Uh, so like, like on a per year basis, but I'll, I'll look into that. I think that will give you, that will help you sort of gauge sort of an economic magnitude of like how busy or, or crowded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, if, if they're handling many of the cases or just man, most of the cases can, it's not, uh, you know, in that fuzzy category and, mo yeah, and so it may, may not go to the court. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I, I have this again, this is very early stage. So I have a, I have a chart here that uh, we literally put together last night, not in the oh. slides yet, was that it looks like uh, over time, roughly somewhere between 700 on average cases per court uh, every year. But if you will have to divide that by the number of judges in, in the case to get a per judge basis, but just to give you some flavor. Uh, but okay. we'll look into it as a per judge case that which that number I unfortunately don't have right now, but it's around okay. 700. So, so you're talking about each court has uh, uh, a few judges, how many judges? Are you talking yeah, about? so that varies quite a bit as well. Uh, you know, that example in Southern California was 20, but there are other courts where they have many more judges and, and other courts that are fewer, but uh, I wish I had that average number here right now, but I, I but see. I okay, okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, roughly 20 was Southern California. Uh, so yeah, great. Thanks for uh, your question. So this is um, the basic research design uh, we have. Where on the left-hand side, we want to understand, you know, use proxies for innovation, and we use the most common, which is patent patenting, relevant to our setting. And we, our primary variable of interest is this interaction variable and in, in, in sort of a different dif difference in differences style where a PPP venue is basically an indicator variable that equals one when a firm is headquartered in a county subject to this uh, regulation. But as we discussed, there can potentially be forum shopping, which will threaten our assumption that firms have to file their cases in headquarter. But empirically, we seem to find 
and for good reasons that a, a lot of these firms do indeed engage in litigation where they're headquartered, especially for smaller firms. Um, and a post PPP is an indicator variable, as we discussed, uh, excluding 2011 before and after three years. Uh, we'd like, yeah, as we just, just discussed with uh, Josh, perhaps extending these windows, which we haven't tried, can, can be interesting to sort of examine a long, longer run effects as firms form clear expectations of the permanency of this law. Uh, we have firm and year fixed effects uh, at its base. We try other robustness tests uh, later that will show and have time varying control variables as well. Uh, before we jump into the regression results, uh, there are two, again, key validation uh, that we wanted to explore that's available for us in terms of data is the following. So we compare the PPP districts to the non-PPP districts. The red line is PPP, blue is non-PPP. And we basically compare two metrics of efficiency uh, that we found reasonable. One is case durations. And as you can see, right up to the, uh, you know, the shock, there's no statistical difference between the two courts. Uh, but a simple plot shows that they continue to diverge after this regulation, consistent with these, again, expert judges. The, in that so Southern California example, the five judges with expertise handling 75% of the patent cases, which promotes efficiency. Uh, similar to appeal rate, where, uh, again, these, um, you know, both the plaintiff and defendant have the uh, right to appeal the outcome and not agree, perhaps to even disagree with the outcome and say, you know, we want to appeal. And that appeal rate also appears to significantly drop disproportionately more for the PPP districts relative to non-PP and a difference in difference estimate uh, that is st statistically significant. Uh, what's important to note here is that this pattern is specific to patent litigation and the law was specific to patent litigation. So one falsification exercise that we did to perhaps rule out if there's some heterogeneity in, in trends across these two courts, we looked at the, the same patterns uh, for other cases, non-patent cases, and we find that the two courts do not differ in that sort of pattern in terms of duration and appeal rate, sort of, again, validating that the PPP was specific to the PPP district, as well as specific to patent cases only and not true for other types of litigation. Um, so once after we validate it, we basically now, you know, use that uh, research design to sort of look at uh, innovation patterns, and we use a patent litigation here and find roughly a six percent increase in terms of the number of patents among firms headquartered in PPP after the shock before uh, relative to baseline averages. Uh, again, we won't have time to discuss probably the robustness test, but in, in table eight and figure five, uh, we, uh, you know, explore with other uh, sort of uh, robustness tests across different definitions, fixed effects and control groups even. Uh, also, we find what we call uh, an extensive margin effect, where the affected firms are roughly 14 to 15 percent more likely uh, to patent, uh, the non-patenters are likely to patent for the first time, uh, you know, firms that are headquartered in these uh, districts relative to those that are not in other 81 districts. Um, this is kind of the time series pattern. Again, uh, our, our sample stops plus minus three years. Uh, not sure what will happen as we extend this. Uh, but uh, consistent with, uh, you know, difference, uh, sort of a uh, parallel trends assumption being an important identifying assumption in diff and diff, we find no statistical uh, differences before, but a, a discernible pattern afterwards, uh, a year after at least, uh, once the shock was implemented. Um, we also, again, look at uh, inputs for innovation. And the patent data allows us to investigate uh, inventor level uh, you know, um, sample. There's about 300,000 active inventors uh, in our sample. And we wanna basically run an inventor level analysis to see and track uh, at a high level, uh, whether firms, uh, inventors that are linked to firms that are affected by the regulation, whether they're more likely to stay 
and whether they're more likely to be hired by these firms, again, relative to these control firms before and after. Uh, I'll spare the details of how it, this is exactly defined. This is following prior literature, just as one example, Bernstein 2015 uses this, where we define stairs as those that stay with the firm, leavers who leave, and newcomers are those that are newly introduced in the data. And uh, using this sort of definition, uh, levers are compared to stairs. They're sort of the logical opposite. We find that firms that are affected are, are you know, inventors that are linked to affected firms are less likely to leave that firm, whereas firms that are affected by this regulation are more likely to hire roughly somewhere between 7 to 10 percent more, again, relative to the control group firms. Um, and now uh, to the three mechanism tests. Uh, the first one is to investigate whether our effect is concentrated among what we will call uh, in innovations with fuzzy boundaries. And we again rely on prior research that uh, defines what's called an exploratory or explorative innovation, where we're going to now kind of explore innovations that are in, in the boundaries uh, of, of their fuzziness. And our a proxy is two proxies. One is what's called new tech class patent. Uh, a firm, when a firm enters a new technological sort of domain, uh, it, we get an indicator variable, variable for that. And a new knowledge patent where uh, a firm files a patent where it does not cite its own patents, but cites others, uh, again, as a proxy for it being sort of a new groundbreaking, uncertain, unclear uh, type of innovation. And across both proxies, uh, we find that our positive effect is predictably concentrated among new tech class patents, as well as what we call new knowledge patents relative to its benchmark. And uh, the difference is, is statistically uh, different significantly different. Um, as our second mechanism test, uh, again, we want to explore whether our effects are concentrated among uh, firms with high exposure or litigation risk exposure. We exploit two proxies. One is what we call ex ante risk. And it basically, at a high level, means it's, it's a sort of a weighted average of uh, the what's called a, techno, a technology class. It's the industry sort of classification of, of patents. And we can get a weighted average sense of how much exposure a firm has to certain technology classes. And we link that to the inherent litigation risk of each tech class. So certain tech classes are known to be much more litigation risk prone, whereas certain tech classes are less so. And we, get, if we, we try to weight, you know, average those out in a weighted way, weighted average of, the, of those tech class uh, litigation risk at, at the firm level so to get a firm level measure of exposure. We do a similar exercise for duration. Uh, again, there's inherent characteristics at the tech class level uh, specific to a patent on how long patent litigation usually takes against patent cases that are shorter. We do a weighted average across all those tech classes and link it to, to uh, you know, construct a firm level measure of how much uh, ex expected duration they have conditional on litigation. And using both of these proxies, we again uh, find across both of our intensive and extensive margin innovation proxies, we basically do a triple interaction here where uh, we find our results to be incrementally stronger uh, for companies that have higher ex ante exposure and litigation across both risk and duration. Again, consistent with our mechanism that the PPP is reducing uh, these frictions. And finally, as a third mechanism test, we expect our results to be stronger among firms that are resource constrained and uh, across proxies of uh, resource constraints, we use private firms as a, an indicator of firms that are more resource constrained compared to public firms and small innovators, uh, in, uh, innovators that don't have a lot of uh, huge patent portfolio, smaller patent portfolio, basically, five or less in, in, to be specific. And we find that our results are, again, concentrated incrementally stronger for these uh, resource constrained firms, about three to 4% incremental effect. And we have two sort of robustness tests uh, that I like to discuss. There's many more, but we have uh, one, and we ran a entropy matching result, again, to account for the fact that 
uh, ports might be systematically different even after including these controls and fixed effects. And another uh, similar in spirit is um, to sort of investigate you or use a different control group entirely and use a uh, you know control group that is closer in proximity to the treatment venue. So the red region, as we saw earlier, are the 13 districts that are treated and the blue are its neighboring counties that we use as uh, a alternative control group to perhaps reduce concerns about, again, unobserved heterogeneity across these districts. And we, again, continue to find consistent and similar uh, results. So um, in conclusion, uh, our evidence supports the notion that judicial efficiency uh, as implemented by this regulation improves innovation. We uh, use increased patenting activity as well as labor market hiring as an indication for that. Uh, we have three mechanism tests where our results are concentrated among firms that have unclear boundaries uh, in its innovation, where they're exposed more to high ex ante litigation risk, as well as firms that are resource constrained. And we hope to contribute to sort of the understanding of how institutions such as the judicial system can affect innovation. And we believe it ultimately speaks to the, the discussion of understanding the balance between intellectual property rights, efficiency, judicial efficiency and innovation incentives. Uh, so thanks you everyone. Uh, again, happy to answer questions, but if you don't, uh, again, thank you. Really appreciate uh, for all of you being here and giving me the opportunity to present. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very <clears throat> thank you very much David, for came for your contribution yeah I have a one last question so the sure. uh yeah. so the the uh just in terms of the magnitude uh, you know what's uh, what's uh, what's the uh, total like roughly in your sample the total number of court cases uh, related to this kind of patent uh in comparison with the total number for uh the technology patents that are actually filed or granted uh, I see. So I think you're saying like of all the patents that are filed, how, what percent sort of in, engage in litigation? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Because I'm, yeah, so, yeah. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, just 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 have a roughly idea of you know how many of the cases are actually have this kind of dispute because I have no idea. That's yeah, yeah. So of all at a patent level, so mind you, firms have multiple patents, right? IBM has right, like right, right. thousands, but at a patent level. Uh, in its lifetime, the probability is somewhere between three to five percent. So it's not very high. So okay. a patent, a conditional on it being granted, it has a roughly three to five percent that it will get sued. But again, okay. at a firm level, it's it's much higher because you have many of these. Uh, they're not IID per se, but it, it it will add up and and sort of. But but I but those patents may not necessarily be in the the fuzzy like scientific uh, ah. or with its patent board and that, but most of the cases I thought were probably in the infringement of the patent. Uh, is it or is or specific to the to the fuzzy definition that uh, that, that you talk about? Because there are so, different kinds of lawsuits uh, related to patents. You're right. Uh, so are you saying like what percent of patents that get litigated are in this fuzzy region? Yes, 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 yes. That's a good question. I, I actually don't have that number again. Uh, apologies, it's a new fit new. Yeah, okay. Exactly. We can we can get that number. Um, but having said that, what what's I can what I can tell you is that patent litigation again, depending on what benchmark you have in mind, are all generally quite fuzzy again relative to to uh, other disputes. But yes, within our sample, what we define to be particularly fuzzy, we'd like to know that number as well. So I don't have that number to you right now. Another knowledge to throw out there is that um, it also varies a lot by technology class. So, uh, for example, patents that are in, uh, you know, pharmaceutical are known to be far less fuzzy. Uh, it's uh, it's actually a physical property. We 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 exactly know, like if you if you invented some kind of molecule, for example, it's it's very clear relative to patents in software or other industries, it's uh, tech classes, it's much fuzzier. So it will also vary right. quite a bit depending on what class of patents you look at. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, your thank questions. You. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Mm. Thank are you. There, are there another question? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask you a question.
I guess we're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Kim, for your contribution and uh, your effort. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everyone, joined us uh, today. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much to, to take the time to visit to us today, dear Professor Kim. It's really, really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Yeah, goodbye. And I hope to see you soon in Egypt today, Professor Kim. Oh, yeah. We'd love to. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye.